God's greeting. Grace be to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits that are before his throne, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings here on earth. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord together. Hymn number 327, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creed.
God's will for our lives this morning comes from Exodus 20, what we know as the Ten Commandments. And in my devotions, I began at the beginning of the year with Genesis, and so just recently read through Exodus and Deuteronomy um, in Numbers. But it, I was so struck that, that after this profound worship time that Israel and Moses, they all had on Mount Sinai, and then he goes up and he receives the law, amen? Imagine how excited he was coming down after 40 days, and the people had gone nuts. And he smashes that first, those first tables of the law, and there's repentance, and there's a mess. And so today, as, as, as we hear God's law, let's reflect on our own lives, on where we're at in our relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, and where these words of the Lord lead us, what, what steps of obedience they lead us to, even today. Exodus 20, this is the word of God. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, your son, your daughter, your male or female servant, your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And Jesus summarized this law when he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Let's take a moment in quiet to just sit before the Lord and reflect on, on how we're doing with that. And then we'll hear God's words of assurance. Amen. From Romans 5, verse 8, hear these words. God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And let's profess together. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, 
Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing about that in hymn number 314. Sunday night from Ephesians chapter 3. So I'm, I'm going to begin our prayer with that and um, those words that the Lord gives us to pray back to him and then continue. Let's pray. Lord, we kneel, or right now we're sitting before you, the God from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And we pray, Lord, that out of your glorious riches, you will strengthen us with power through your Holy Spirit so that Jesus Christ will dwell in our hearts, our whole hearts, by faith. And we pray that as we are rooted and established in love, together with all the other saints, all the other believers around the world, that, that you will give us the, 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 the power the strength to grasp and to experience, to understand in our head and our heart the length and breadth and height and depth of your love that surpasses knowledge, that we might be filled to all the measure of the fullness of God. And now to you, O Lord, who are able to do far more abundantly than we can even ask or imagine through your power that is at work within us. To you be the glory in the church and through Christ Jesus forever and ever. Lord, we thank you that the scriptures not only give us words of life about you, but they give us words of life to even speak and pray to you. And 
We thank you for the, the, the ways that, that, that you are, are leading us by your work, by your grace through faith into this full measure of the fullness of God. In, into our identity as sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, as we sang, we, we confess that, that we, we are prone to wander. Lord, we are prone to wander. Our hearts wander, our minds wander, our bodies wander. And so we, we, we come this morning to confess before you ways that, that we have wandered from you, choices that, that we have made that, that ha have not been in alignment with our faith and our commitment and our, our life as men and women of God, as followers of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, as, as we even just read, we thank you for the assurance that you give us of your forgiveness, of your righteousness that you put on us. We thank you for the ongoing work of your Holy Spirit within us. That we can live lives that are, are, are holy and pleasing to you. And so I, I pray, Lord, right now for anyone who is struggling in, in a deep way with some sin in their life, a, a besetting sin that, that has a hold over them, that they are unable to experience freedom in Christ. I pray that you would break that bondage as you led your people out of Egypt and broke that bondage, that you would break the bondage that any sin, the grip it has on anyone, even here and now, by the power of your Holy Spirit. We invite you, Jesus, into our whole heart. And we pray this morning, dear Lord, for each and every other need, for physical needs of healing. We lift up and, and, and pray those who, for those who need your touch now, dear Father. For those who are emotionally or psychologically depressed or, or just despondent, dear Lord, that, that you would break through the, the storm clouds with, with a, a ray of hope. We pray, dear Father, for those who are, are struggling to find the, the right work or job or occupation, that you would open doors for that. We pray, dear Lord, where there are for, for healthy marriages and family life. We, 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 we pray for your blessing on husbands and wives, on parents and children, dear Lord. We, we pray for your blessing on those who are employers and employees and Thank you for the gift of work that you give us, that, that we can work to the glory of God. For all of our students, dear Lord, who are, who are in, in, in school or in college or in university, for your blessing upon them as well. For all there is to learn about the fullness of your creation, dear Father. And that, that, that we can use that to give your glory. So we thank you for your presence with us here today, for, for, for meeting us as we come to meet you. And we give you the honor and glory, and we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is number 24 in Hymns for the Family of God. Let's stand together.
have a very short scripture this morning, and if, if you wonder why I'm, I'm preaching on Jesus' baptism like a week before Palm Sunday, hopefully you'll see. From the Gospel of Mark, and this account is in Matthew and Luke as well, I'm just going to read from the Gospel of Mark, verses 9 to 13. At that time, Mark begins his gospel right with Jesus' ministry. He doesn't give us anything about Jesus' birth. He begins with his ministry. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Our, our text is... The, the voice of the Father to Jesus. You are the son whom I love, or the older version I'll use today, you are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. I am well pleased. I was baptized on January 4, 1953 by Reverend Oren Holtrup. Don was too, probably Esther was too. In fact, years later, I, um, Reverend Holtrop retired around here. So when I was, I was pastoring, I, I, I met him. I remember one time him putting his, his hand on my shoulder and he said, you never know what God's gonna do, you put a little water on somebody. <laughs> the only thing I remember from that is the pictures and the baptistry, which is still in the front of former Prospect Park Christian Reformed Church, now a Gwen Pastor, but that my parents had me baptized in a dress. I guess that was a thing to do, but what's even funnier is that they kept it, and we had our son baptized in the same dress. I still don't know why. It was like a baptism gown. But probably for me, one of the most special parts of pastoral ministry were baptisms. And I got to baptize my first granddaughter and my two grandsons after that. And what a, what, what a precious moment, right? To, to, to just voice these covenant promises of God to a baby who knows nothing of what's going on and then of celebrating baptisms of children, but also adults. We had a great blow-up pool at Madison Ave, and we had a lot of adults who made commitments to Christ. And a little more water helped convey that image of dying and rising with Christ. And so this morning, I want you to think about if, for those of you who have been baptized, if you haven't been baptized, I, I want you to let this message be God's invitation to you to, to, to hear, as, as Peter put it in Acts chapter 2, believe and be baptized. But I want you to remember the waters of baptism, whether you were a baby, or an adult, whether it's a little water or a lot of water, and to remember the promises of God, of what it meant to receive that gift. I love this answer in the Catechism of what does it mean to be washed with Christ's 
blood and spirit? And read it with me if you can see it, the answer. To be washed with Christ's blood means that God, by grace, has forgiven our sins because of Christ's blood poured out for us in his sacrifice on the cross. To be washed with Christ's spirit means that the Holy Spirit has renewed and sanctified us to be members of Christ so that more and more we become dead to sin and live holy and blameless lives. We're often very aware of the image of washing, of water, of washing, of washing our sins away, of Jesus' blood washing our sins away. But baptism is more than that. It's more than that. And this puts it so well, and we'll see that in some other scriptures. It's more and more becoming dead to sin and alive to Christ. I love that more and more. Baptism is a picture, and that's why this sermon's appropriate for two weeks before Easter, of us dying with Christ and rising with Christ. Something dies in us, even though we still struggle with sin. Paul puts it this way in Romans 6. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as, can you say just as? Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, say we too, we too. may live a new life. Of more and more becoming dead to sin and living a holy and blameless life. We see here this connection between our baptism and Jesus' baptism. Baptism is an outward sign of an inner spiritual reality. Amen? Amen. I got him to say amen here. You tell your dad. <laughs> of dying and rising with Christ. I, I want you to notice what we see happening at Jesus and his baptism. The heavens open. Let me see if I have it. Oh, yeah, there it is. The, 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 the heavens open. Is that beautiful? They're torn open. They're torn open. Baptism isn't just about us getting to heaven when we die, but it's about the riches of heaven getting to us while we live. That not only can we be forgiven of our sins, but we can actually have new life in Christ where we have victory over sin. Amen? Amen? In the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit. This, this image of being washed in the Holy Spirit as well. They, they go together. That's why we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinitarian baptism. So we're connected with Christ. So then the words of the Father to Jesus at his baptism, if we're united with Christ, are the words of the Father to us. You are my son or daughter whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. Can you hear it? Not just applied to Jesus, but applied to you. Can you hear it? Can you remember it? At some point in church history, the, the, the church fathers began a practice to help people remember this. And they put a bowl of water in the back of the sanctuary. And when people came to worship, they would dip their hand in it and touch their forehead and sometimes make the sign of a cross as a way to remember. That's still done in Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches, although most people who do it don't know why they're doing it. In our Reformed tradition, the baptistry is always at the front. It always bothers me. I go to some Reformed churches and the baptistry is hidden in the back. But the same way the communion table is here, the baptistry is here for you to look upon it and remember. To remember the promises of God. To remember God's promises that we receive in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, but also a baptism. That's why it's up front. 
That's why it's here, for you to see it, to remember. Martin Luther advised his followers to wake up every morning and say to themselves and the devil, I am baptized. In fact, he, he kind of made it a chant. He said, say it more than once. I am baptized. I am baptized. I am baptized. To remember that. In fact, many believe that at the end of this one verse of his well-known Tim, A Mighty Fortress, about the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not, one little word shall fell him. Many believe that one little word is the, the Latin, baptizatus sum, baptizatus sum. I am baptized. I am baptized. The devil will run. I am baptized. Today I want to invite you to remember your baptism. To remember that baptism is a picture of not just Jesus, but of me and of you as we've been baptized, dying and rising with Christ. It's a sign and a seal of this. I want to invite you to hear the words of the Father that he spoke to Jesus. Say them to you as well and see the Holy Spirit descend upon you. You are my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. Can you hear it? Can you believe it, that the Father would say this to you? Sometimes all we hear are the voices of what we aren't. We aren't good enough, or smart enough, or tall enough, or thin enough, or holy enough. We struggle with our righteousness and our identity. We long for a sense of acceptance, approval, security, significance. We long for this because God designed us to live in it. But sin has separated us and created a huge gap of alienation. Paul, writing to some of the Jewish people in his day, says, They did not know the righteousness that comes from God, but sought to establish their own. And you know what? So do we. We pretend and we perform as two ways of establishing our own righteousness. We pretend by making ourselves better than we are. We, we pretend for God and we should do, we surely pretend for other people. We perform by trying to please God by what we do. And you know what, this is quite human. Tim Keller, I, I, I love this line, says, self-righteousness Works righteousness is the default mode of, of the sinful human heart. And just like we say, we are prone to wander to that also. Sometimes we're fed by a false narrative. God loves you conditionally. I call this the Santa Claus picture of God. Right? Santa Claus is watching. You see if you're naughty and nice. If you're naughty, you get cold. If you're nice, you get a good gift. This is often even believers' view of God. You, you hear it. You hear it. What did I do to deserve this? What did I do to deserve Now, God invites our questions. I preached about that here. But, but, but we often live in that mode. In a wonderful book called The Good and Beautiful You by James Bryan Smith, He's reflecting on what he calls graceless Christians. He said there's a general sense that God is disappointed with us at best and downright angry with us at the worst. When God is portrayed from pulpits to Sunday school rooms as a God who punishes bad little boys and girls, it's hard to imagine a God who knows our every sin and loves us still. And isn't that what we just heard in the assurance? God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. You are loved by God. John 4, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. 1 John 4, 19, we love because God loved us. And Romans 5, 8. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to believe this? I prayed Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. He was praying 
that they would know, that they would experience. They were already Christians, but that they would experience that, that ocean of God's love that we sung about, the height, the depth, the length and breadth of it, to be filled to all the measure of the fullness of God. Jesus heard the Father's voice. You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And none of us have any trouble believing that. But can you hear the Father say that to you? You are my beloved son and daughter too. Through your relationship with me in Jesus Christ, by my grace through faith, baptism is a picture of that. Why is it so hard to believe that? In 11 of the letters of Paul and Peter and John, this term beloved is used. Sometimes it's translated as dear friends, but I'll take beloved. It's the word agape, agape, my, my, my deeply loved, unconditionally loved son. A couple of examples, Colossians 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. And he goes on how that affects how we live. Or 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born and knows God. The apostles learned that they were beloved, and they tried to help the early church to, to grasp this. Jesus revealed it to them. This gets at our identity as who we are. Who am I? Who are you? What do people usually answer? Somebody asks, who, who are you? We give our name. Oh, you're Dutch? Oh, we, we, we give our job. Oh, you're a pastor? Who am I? I'm a child of God. Who am I in my deepest identity? 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says, We all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory and we're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. This isn't about when we get to heaven. This is now. We're being transformed. Imagine God in the face of Jesus looking at you. He knows you completely. He knows all the stuff. And still loves you. It's this love of God for us that sent Jesus so that we can be right with God, literally have a righteousness that comes from God, that comes from Christ, not of our own. Romans 3. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. To all who believe. It's this righteousness that makes us beloved. It's this righteousness we sing about in that well-loved hymn, Solid Rock, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. Because the Father is seeing me and seeing Christ. And that's the righteousness that makes us beloved. Beloved sons and daughters, because we are adopted by the Father. Romans 8, 15, 16. By him we cry, that's by Christ we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Or Galatians 4, 7. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. Since you are a son, God has made you an heir. This is the new identity. This is our deepest identity in Jesus Christ. I am a child in God. We are adopted by God in Christ. This is who I am. And this little piece of furniture in front of your sanctuary is here to remind you of that every week. But we need more than a piece of furniture every Sunday, don't we? We need to be reminded daily, or as Martin Luther said, to stand up every morning and say, I am baptized. My sins have been washed away and I have died and risen with Christ. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Reflect on that. 
Just think about that. The Catechism asks us, why are you called a Christian? A Christian. And I love this answer, because by faith, I am a member of Christ, and so I share his anointing. Now think about that. If, if I share his anointing, I, I share in that baptism. I share in that dying and rising with him. I'm anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a free conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for eternity. Why is he called God's only begotten son when we're also God's children? Because Christ alone is the eternal, natural son of God. We, however, are adopted children of God. Adopted by grace through Christ. Adopted to be part of God's faith. We are prone to forget this identity and sometimes live like orphans instead of as sons and daughters. We live trying to be a good Christian. We, we, we try to manage sin by the whack-a-mole method. You, you ever do the whack-a-mole on the boardwalk? You know, the mole pops up, you whack one and another one pops up. That's somehow we're, how we try to manage sin. This sin pops up, I whack it down. Then another one pops up, I whack it down. Instead of remembering who we are and inviting the Holy Spirit to free me from bondages of sin that pop up that I can't whack down on my own power. To remember who I am in Christ by faith that Jesus' righteousness has been credited to us apart from works. Another book on this I'll share with a quote that I love by Kevin Adams called Baptism as a Way of Life. I love how he summarizes this. But the biblical images of baptism conceive of identity as a gift. We don't build our own identity, we accept it. Early Christians and many wise ones since taught that to participate in baptism is to receive an identity. It is to enter a particular God-designed, God-engineered, God-built life. In such a view, baptism isn't an episode, but the font of life. After baptism, for the rest of our lives, our faith practices, daily prayer, Sabbath keeping, selfless service, Bible study, reinforce and develop this baptismal life of grace. They all enhance our life as the baptized. The baptized. On a bit of a lighter side, in the movie Brother, Where Art Thou? Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't, but it's a profound movie. There are three escaped convicts who come upon a scene by the river where a church is baptizing people. People are lined up in their white robes and these guys are in their convict shirts. And Delmar, seeing this, is just captivated and he, and he runs in the water to the head of the line, cuts in front of everybody, the pastor baptizes him and he comes back to his other escaped convict buddies and he says, well, that's it, boys, I've been redeemed. The preacher done washed away all my sins and transgressions. It's a straight and narrow from here on out. And ever, everlasting's my reward. Neither God nor man's got nothing on me now. Come on in, boys. The water's fine. This morning, I want to invite you to remember your baptism. Or if you haven't been baptized, to anticipate it to hear the gospel invitation, to believe, to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and receive the gifts that God offers. To prepare for it, speak to me or one of the elders here if you want to know more. This is a beautiful picture that God gives us of not only our sin washed away, but a freedom from the power and the grip of it. A victory over Satan in all of his attacks. 
by dying and rising with Jesus, by seeing the reality that today, too, the heavens still crack open and the Holy Spirit is poured out into us over and over and over again. It's not a one-shot deal. And the voice of the Father says to us, you, you are my beloved sons and daughters in whom I am well pleased. Remember your baptism, your identity in Christ, and who you are as a child of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this good news of the gospel. In the midst of a world full of, full of bad news, in the midst of social media often tearing people down, in the midst of, of our own struggle with our self-images and, and with our life, how we feel about what we're doing and not doing. Bring us back, Lord. Bring us back. Remember who we are in you. That we can live out of that identity through the power of your Holy Spirit by faith in receiving your grace that you pour out to us. And that you are able to do far more abundantly than we can even ask or imagine through your power at work with Thank you, Lord, that you still speak. And we tune our ears to hear your voice as you say to us, you are my beloved son, my beloved daughter, through your relationship with Jesus Christ. And in you, I am well pleased. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of response was written by Charles Wesley when he experienced and realized this truth of the gospel in his life. It begins with a question, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's love? That he died for me? Is that possible? And as you'll see, he discovered the answer is yes. Let's stand and sing Thank mm -hmm. you.
We just say amen again. All God's people said, amen. amen. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.